Hi, everyone. My name is Nora Gerby. I'm the founder of Who Cares Chronicles. Thank you. I'm the founder of Who Cares Chronicles. Um, we are a partner of Change Now, and we provide content on several topics that we feel are urgent to speak of or that we should continually speak of. And over the years with Change Now, um, we have held this panel with a wide range of worldwide stakeholders to keep an ear to the ground on today's challenges for human rights. And um, actually, this year, we, we had planned to have, I'd like to mention this as a start, we had planned to have two speakers from Sudan. And given the situation, uh, they were unable to attend. And I think it's a really interesting year to, to, to continue to speak of this, particularly because 2023 marks the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it article, it's all the articles of the Human Rights Declaration affect everyone's lives, from the need to close the gender gap to ensuring everyone has access to education or clean water, for example. So as we mark the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I thought it, it's still very important and prevalent to revisit how we can advance and progress on the promise of the milestone document. So again, this year, I'm very honored to share the stage with people who take concrete steps towards establishing supports and systems that are human rights-based, gender-responsive, disability-inclusive, and age-sensitive. But before we start, and before I introduce the first person that will come and join us on a keynote, I thought I would take you down history, a little walk down memory lane, because history is full of clues and indication of why we are where we are. And this year, while preparing this panel, I kept thinking of the Valladolid debate. I don't know if any of you in the room know the Valladolid debate. It's a very little known part of history, but it's a very important one. Um, it is also known as the controversy of Valladolid. The Valladolid debate obviously took place in, in Spain, um, in 1550 to 1551, so that debate lasted about a year. And it was the first moral debate in European history. And its, its perspective was to discuss the rights and treatment of indigenous people by European colonizers. It was held in the Colegio de San Gregorio in the Spanish city of Valladolid, as I said. And it was a moral and theological debate about the conquest of the America, its justification for the conversion to Catholicism, and more specifically, about the relations between European settlers and natives of the New World. It consisted of a number of opposing views about the way natives were to be integrated into Spanish society, their conversion to Catholicism, and of course, their rights. And at that time, a bishop named Chiapas Bartolomeu de las Casas argued that the Amerindians were free men in the natural order, despite their practice of human sacrifices and other such customs, deserving the same considerations as the colonizers. Opposing this view were a number of scholars and priests, including humanist scholar Juan Ginés de Sepulveda, who argued that human sacrifice of innocence, cannibalism, and other such crimes against nature, as he named it, were unacceptable and should be suppressed by any means possible, including war. The affair is considered one of the earliest examples of moral debates about colonialism, human rights of colonized peoples, and international relations. I wanted to start with this just to give you a bit of context because over the years, as I said, we've been discussing this human rights from many, many different angles. And this year, I would have been honored to discuss the war in Sudan because, like I said, when they mentioned any means necessary, including war, it would have been a nice, interesting aspect to contextualize again and again as history repeats itself and how wars are also very much interlinked with our rights. And also, as these first, um, the first person that was um, arguing that Native Americans had the same right and should deserve the same rights was a priest, 
I feel like we're really uh, in line today as our first speaker, without further ado, that I would like to introduce his himself, a priest who has been advocated for the rights of people today, just like Bartolomeu de las Casas did at his time. And now I'd like to welcome Reverend Jide Michele. Chair, my friend. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Well, I'm truly grateful to be here today at the Change Now Summit. Uh, this is actually an important platform to promote the ideal of equality, diversity, and inclusion. I'm thankful to Nora and her team, and I'm encouraged. You might tell that I'm a little nervous, but I'm often quite nervous because I always speak about some real, real stuff. Now, my name is Jide McCauley, and for those who don't know me, um, I'm not Jedi, and I'm not Jide. And if you forget my name this afternoon, just remember the happy, holy homosexual. But seriously speaking, um, people also call me Mama Jide, and because of some of my activism that has drawn together, you know, people of faith and, their, and supporting their sexuality. I believe I have the mother spirit that's carried many along. Now, I was born in London, and, but I was raised in Lagos, Nigeria. My parents were students in England in the 1960s. My mother is late, but my father is still alive. I was raised in a very conservative Christian home and the environment uh, where sexuality was never part of our conversation, let alone homosexuality. Now, of course, growing up, you know, my African parents have the ideal idea what their children are going to be, so I was going to be the lawyer in the family. I did study law, but I think I remember giving my uh, certificate to my father to say, well, I want to go ahead and study theology, <laughs> which is what I wanted to do. Now, of course, in preparing for today, I was thinking also about intersectionality. And I thought maybe my middle name should have been intersectionality because I stand before you as a black African, a Nigerian, a British man, and someone who is openly gay. I'm also a priest, and I'm also living with HIV for the past 20 years. I don't know if that's mind-blowing, but people might say, wow, this is what you should never be. And of course, I have experienced so much with all of this, I've experienced racism, xenophobia. Um, you know, in Nigeria, they believe that Africans cannot be, cannot be gay, so, and a Christian also cannot be gay. And of course, there has been a lot of conversations that say that, you know, uh, uh, HIV is a punishment for homosexuality. But I would say also, my journey has not been easy, but I come with humility, respect, and courage. You've had it all, you know, but we can also begin to unpack those messages. Coming out as gay for me was in 1994. I didn't know much about my own sexuality at the time, but that was a change now moment for me. So I have been committed to making changes ever since. So 17 years ago, I started an organization called House of Rainbow on the backdrop of political and religious homophobia in my native country, Nigeria. It was intended to create safe spaces for reconciling faith and sexuality. Within months after we started, you know, what was dubbed as the gay church, but we believe that we became the human rights church, depending, of course, on who you're talking to and who you ask. Most Nigerians are intolerant of homosexuality and will use religion to promote and justify their position. I am mindful of the in incredible allies in Nigeria, and some might be even in this um, uh, session today. Now, of course, House of Rainbow um, started in 2006, and we focus on helping people build their relationships, reconciling their faith and their sexuality, because, you know, when I found out that, you know, I do not I found out that the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. Some of you might still have that position. But it's important for me to share that good news with others. And that was why I left the comfort of England and returned to Nigeria. 
uh, in 2006. But we also have our work around in many other countries, uh, up to about 22 countries where House of Rainbow is impacting and saving lives. Of course, we provide a lot of other services, including sexual health, counseling, pastoral care, and of course, we also support survivors of human trafficking and labor exploitation. The list is actually endless. But of course, my organization is also a place where we uh, say to people that G-A-Y means God accepts you, God adores you, and God admires you. It is so important to affirm people and let them know that they are what? Everything. Now, of course, with privileges comes responsibilities. As someone who is both Nigerian and British, black, gay, a Christian living with HIV, it is a privilege to speak out on many of the issues, you know, of injustice that I see to others and also to myself. It is important for me to speak boldly and confidently about the injustices around sexual minorities around the world. For example, many countries in the global south still rule with a legacy of colonialism. I'm sure we've had it all over the conference uh, in these past few days. Climate change has historically been blamed on homosexuality, trust me. When there's an earthquake, it's the gays. When there is a storm, it's the gays. You've had it all. When there is a, a crash somewhere, they always blame the gay community. I've never known any group of people so powerful, but you might agree with me that the law that infringes on our human rights of any marginalized group affects the society at large. Now, my organization has been using technology for as far as we, can, we know, but we continue to use it. We use it to reach people because there are places around the world where it is still against the law to be gay. But thank God for technology. You can put a headset on and join our program every week and listen to encouraging messages. For example, we use Clubhouse for our God Adores You moment. So if you're on Clubhouse, you can, tell, you can join us every Sunday. We're reaching people across many places. Now, politics and sexuality is also very important. Nigeria is a former Commonwealth nation and still have laws today that were you know, um, from the imperial British colonial era. In 2006, I started House of Rainbow in Nigeria, and I remember a few months after we started, I was in front of the Nigerian parliament, you know, in a public debate, appealing to the Nigerian government and, and lawmakers not to pass the anti-gay bill to law. Now, unfortunately, the law, the bill became law in 2014. But what was very, what was problematic about it all is that there were many politicians who were supporting the bill, just like you can hear today in Ghana and also uh, in Uganda, in Namibia, and many other countries today. But what was so sad about this law is that my dad was also one of the religious leaders who was supporting the government in passing the bill. It was heartbreaking for me. But of course, that is politics as well. There was an article in Wall Street Journal, early 2007, that says, anti-gay bill divides family. And of course, described my father as Reverend Macaulay Sr. and myself as Reverend Macaulay Jr., who were actually not in agreement with the law. Fatal sexuality is also a key part of my message today. Decolonization of religion is very, very important. As a Christian and a chaplain, and a priest living with HIV. I recognize many people like myself who struggle with reconciling their faith and their sexuality. It is important to understand the need of querying the Bible through the experiences of those marginalized. Religion has been used to demonize the LGBT community, but we are the composers of your music in church. We are the directors of the music in church. We are the directors of the bass choir we are the bishops and the priests, and we all make things happen in the church. But let me talk about health and sexuality. One in four LGBT persons is more likely to develop mental health. 
LGBT people living with HIV are faced with multiple challenges of discrimination in their society, in their family circles, in their faith circles, in the healthcare system, in the prison, in employment, and so on. First, we must call on, first we are called an abomination for being sin gender loving. But then HIV is a virus that is manageable, it's, its transmission can be prevented. And for those on effective medication, U equals U is the new message. It means undetectable equals untransmittable. HIV care has, a long, has come a long way and we still have a long way to go. So it's time that we break the stigma, the shame, the denial, and the discrimination. To date, HIV has claimed lives 36.3 million individuals live with HIV. Approximately 37.7 million people worldwide are living with, the, with, the AIDS, uh, if, um, with, living with AIDS. But the medical advancement is so important and so significant. And it has improved the lives of people that are found with this condition. So between 2010 and 2020, there's been a 43% decline in HIV rates. But unfortunately, in Africa, there is still a great concern in the growing rate of HIV pandemic. Now, why did I start House of Rainbow in 2006? I did so because I was concerned about homophobia and misinformation. I did so because there's so much bad theology and misinterpretation of the scriptures. The political abuse and harassment was fierce. The need for decriminalization and decolonization was so important. And last but not the least, reconciling faith, spirituality, religion, and sexuality was so important. But what can we do? What can we do to make a difference? What can we do to tackle the problems that sexual minorities are facing around the world? I think we should ask our governments everywhere we are to raise the matter in our parliament or in our senate. Decriminalization is very key. There are still countries you know, around the world that are still criminalized, and some of them with the death penalty. Join a protest or a demo for human rights. You know, be at the forefront. You know, solidarity and allyship is also very important. Make your environment truly inclusive, including your workplace. So if there are LGBT people in your workplace, speak out for them. Raise your concerns and make it known. Investment is very important. Grants and funding towards education and employment and, and also projects as well. And of course, you can find me and House of Rainbow on LinkedIn and all social media platforms. My friends, as I conclude this uh, afternoon, I speak for myself and for millions like myself around the world. I am one voice for the vo voiceless and a face for the faceless impossibility. Change now begins with you and also with me. So over the decades, it's clear that freedom comes at a cost. For any marginalized community, of which I'm one, it's no different for the LGBT community, if we strive to make a difference, regardless of the environment or institutions that hold us in captivity, then we must consider the following. First, we need to be organized, because those who are homophobic and drive the evangelical agenda against the LGBT community are seriously organized. They are seriously organized. They're funding homophobia around the world. We need to be organized, in fact, super organized. We need to be well-funded in order to counter and defeat their de derogatory ideals. We, as a people, must also be organized. There must be a high level of cooperation and unity within the LGBT community and with our allies as well. The second thing is that we need to have a clear 
vision to occupy, to occupy spaces of authority. There are legislators who make laws and have no idea of the pain that it causes the LGBT community. We are often oppressed with no opportunity to make a difference. It is time to occupy strategic posts and positions and make a difference politically, economically, and even in religious spaces. Ownership. We need to take ownership as well of the future. With responsibilities and be in control. By taking ownership, I mean provide security for the future, for the future generations of LGBT people and their families as well. It's time to create safe spaces as well for growth and wellness of our people. And also to overtake. To overtake those who obstruct us those who unjustly despise and discriminate against us. We overtake by providing culturally appropriate and traditionally sensitive outcomes. There is time that we must show our true colors and be all of who God, I believe, has created us to be. And the truth is, without compromising the integrity of our course, we overtake with excellence, gratitude, and opulence. Change now. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if you can, anybody can hear me. Thank you so much Good. for this beautiful keynote. We, I'm going to keep you with me as I invite our next speaker. Uh, we're going to get some chairs. Please take this one. I don't know how they're going to set them up. Sit here, I guess. Please sit over there. Sit over there. And I'd like to welcome on stage our, my next co-speaker for this wonderful panel, Mariana Ruenes from Sintrata. Marina, thank you for being here today. Thank you for the invitation. Really happy. And thank you again, Gide, for this wonderful speech. Thank you. And context. Mariana, maybe you want to start by introducing yourself? Yeah. So I am Mexican. Um, and uh, for the last um, 12 years, I've run a uh, little NGO working in Mexico and in Latin America uh, against human trafficking and exploitation. So our work basically um, encompasses both sexual and labor exploitation. And um, during the first years of our work, we were very focused in um, assisting victims in social reintegration uh, to society, um, in setting the agenda and, and at a time where we didn't even have legislation. Um, and over the, over the course of time, we, we discovered that we actually could do a lot more through research. So we, be, we tried to become really good at, at studying and making visible human trafficking. And so I started documenting all the cases, the little cases that we had access to, because I don't know if you know, but less than 1% of victims are ever identified. So we started documenting those cases, studying them, and actually building a map to be able to understand exactly how, when, and where trafficking was happening which led us to, to, to a new understanding, a new vision uh, that actually involved the private sector. So I represent an NGO and I've had to learn over the last years how to talk to, the, to, the, to businesses. Specifically, I work a lot with technology, uh, businesses and enterprises, uh, tourism, um, the tour tourism sector and transports. So I'll be happy to share a little bit of, of our experience, how we evolved into that idea and how we are creating solutions. So, yes, you, you, I, I like to involve everyone in the audience in the process of how we create these discussions. But when we were preparing for this, we had extensive uh, conversation about how you've managed and how agile you've become to create relationships with corporates. And at Change Now, we really try to emphasize the fact that it is conversation rooted in action. Um, and you've given me great examples. Maybe you can share one or two with our audience. 
Yeah, I'd love to. So to, to set the context, I'd like to ask here in the audience if anyone here has been to Cancun, would you lift your hand? Cancuners. Um, if you would like to go to Cancun, can you raise your hand? Everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> Cancun is um, a paradise. We have uh, the Caribbean, we have the cenotes, uh, we have uh, the pyramids, we have a vibrant Mayan community and heritage. But Cancun, however, is also one of the cities that put Mexico um, as one of the countries that has the most sexual exploitation of children in the world, along with Thailand, Brazil, and, and Costa Rica. And so, um, I think we, we wanted to really understand how close it was and to really, as I said, our, our job became to understand and pinpointing exactly how, when, and where it was happening, right? And so we knew that this was taking place mostly in hotels. So we're saying that in Latin America and the Caribbean, child and women sexual exploitation is the most prevalent form of trafficking, and we know that it is happening in hotels. So what we started doing uh, was that we started talking with hotel owners in Mexico. And we conducted a, start, a study that was really interesting and I'm really happy to share with you because we barely published it last year with the Inter-American Bank of Development. Um, and what we did we, was we talked with more than 200 hotel owners across Mexico, like northern border, south border, Caribbean, center of the country, and we asked them, do you really think that this exists? How close is it to you? Do, have you seen any, any trafficking? Have you seen child sexual exploitation? Uh, what measures do you think you could actually apply? Um, and so we had some really interesting fi findings. We, we proved that, in fact, hotel owners do identify child and women sexual exploitation in their communities, in their context, uh, where they have their business. We also understood that they are concerned and they want to take action. More than 90% of hotel owners was actually was, wanted to very urgently take any measures because they saw it as a preventive way um, to, to avoid any other criminal organized activity, for example, in their businesses. So there's, uh, there's actually a lot of willingness. But then I think the main finding for us um, that changed everything was that we also understood that um, there is a huge risk for labor exploitation in hotels that's taking place. Uh, because hotels attract a very vulnerable market in society. They mainly attract people from local communities, from indigenous communities. Um, it's a very feminized sector as well. More than half of the population are women that come from both groups. So women that come from indigenous communities or that are mi migrant workers. Um, and that there are actually illegal hiring practices, that people don't have contracts, don't have contracts in their languages, that some people are living in the same place where they're working. Um, these are forced labor uh, indicators, and these are very widely spread um, in countries uh, like Mexico, where we have a very, very important tourism uh, economy developing. Tourism in Mexico is expected to grow over the last five, uh, five to 10 years now. Mexico is going to become one of the three countries most visited in the entire world, and we have a tourism sector that is informal. Uh, that is informal and that also has this problem of child sexual exploitation. So we understood, okay, yeah, so we need to do something in, in hotels, right? So they're a hotspot for both very important modalities. And, and this goes a little bit beyond the even human trafficking. It's about the prevalence of exploitation in our societies and it's what, what we've learned how to call and we talked about this, right? So it's a continuum of exploitation. So it's labor conditions that won't allow people to actually live a good life in the places where they were born, in the places that we're visiting as foreigners. So, um, what we understood um, was really interesting because talking, and I will give a very concrete example of what my work has become because I think lately what I've been doing is uh, learning how to align human rights objectives with business objectives. And actually understanding uh, that we need to engage these key players in the solutions because otherwise it just doesn't fly, it, it won't work and I've, I've done it, I've tried um, so many things and the NGOs, we've all come together to develop a toolkit and some instruments, but it, it won't happen because we're just not taking uh, into account some very key players because we don't want to talk with them. We don't want to talk with the private sector, right? 
Um, so we started talking to them, them and, and doing a lot of listening. And for example, while doing observation in, in, in Merida and in Cancun, which are these very important places for tourism in Mexico, we realized that, um, for example, hotel owners will complain about a lot of rotation. Uh, they will say one of our biggest issues is that we cannot hold any, uh, any workers. They leave after one month, sometimes two, three months. It's, it's very short, so whatever training, whatever everything, it becomes very expensive for them, actually. Uh, and hotel owners will say, yeah, they don't want to work. And then we interviewed workers and they said, I, I leave these places because working conditions are not good enough for me to actually stay. And so what we're doing, and I'm working on this right now, um, is uh, we are trying to create policies that will actually help both parts. So for example, by putting and installing a policy that will uh, um, help women have better working conditions, have flexibility to actually have a home, have children, uh, by uh, giving women access to managerial positions, and that's just only like the start of it, uh, we're gonna create fidelity in these type of workers. By also realizing that this part of Mexico has a very, very important migration flow, for example, recognizing migrant workers can also be a huge addition uh, to the whole tourism sector in, in, in the country, right? So that's how we're trying to align it, and it's not perfect, and sometimes, um, I will say that sometimes I feel conflicted about, there, there are a lot of controversies uh, trying to uh, find these both, both of these sides kind of understand each other, uh, but I actually think we're getting, we're getting something somewhere. Um, and the transport, you talked about transport as well, which, I mean, the hospitality was one effect, but can you give us, you had one specific example, I don't know if you can share it here, but I yeah. think it's, it's very concrete and people can just really put themselves into the position of the identifier. If I can yeah, thank you. thank you for reminding me of, of that example. I think that was, so um, my first experience working with the private sector was working with Uber. And um, uh, it was very interesting, Mexico City, is, it's a very big city, um, and we, we had the opportunity to start talking with them, and we said, like, what can we do together? And I was wondering, what could we actually do with, with technology? Like, how can technology help us address a problem like, like human trafficking? And we realized, like, drivers and couriers actually know cities better than anyone. They, they see absolutely everything that's going on. And so we thought, what if we learn how to actually give them information and tools for them to report successfully and safely uh, to, this, to this hotline, right? Uh, what if we could actually uh, make them feel reassured? Because what we also, of course, we did as well a lot of listening. So we, I talked to a lot of Uber drivers and couriers to understand how they felt, realize that actually they had um, a lot of distrust of authorities. So they, that's the main reason why they didn't want to report. And so we created, this, we set up in place this very interesting multi-stakeholder initiative where we had uh, the UN women, we had uh, Uber, of course, we had us as an NGO, Sintrata. Um, and so that built trust, actually, and that increased, increased trust. And we actually measured this by doing an RCT that we also conducted digitally. Which, so it was, it's insane. Like, imagine that through an app that people use daily, they will start receiving short messages throughout the course of the year at important times where they will receive very concrete indicators and very concrete success stories of how to react, when to react, what to do. And suddenly in one year, we could have access to more than 200,000 people in one, and, and, and at the reach of our, like it's, it's crazy. Um, so we actually started doing that, and that actually had amazing results in terms of, in terms of victim identification, in terms of reporting crime. Uh, and it was cool also because, for example, if you're in Mexico and you have your Uber app, you can open it and you can find the reporting number there. Um, so if you see anything, you could also do that. So it, again, like working with the private sector might not be perfect, but I think there are a lot of solutions that um, we're learning how to how to how to make work. We're also working with um, uh, with, of course, social media, because that's what we're, on, as, as I said, so how, when, and where trafficking is happening, it's being announced on social media, um, money is being moved around by financial services, big team travels like we travel, so that's kind of the scope of, 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 of our work today. And what we, you and I have been discussing also is um, with, through the guides that we create, we create guides on, we created a guide on fashion, responsible fashion, how to consume, how to produce, 
same on food, and now we're looking at Live Like You Care, which is the series, and we're also looking at what type of tools you could share with us that could just be the same tools that you're sharing with the Uber drivers, and anyone technically could, uh, it's the same principle in, in, in the US where you have the, the, um, the mantra, if you see something, say something. Yeah. I think everyone is capable of identifying something that's a little odd, uh, when they're not <laughs> stuck on their phone. Uh, if we're a little bit more observant, we could pr probably be identifiers as well of odd behaviors or and probably saving lives. And um, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting how you contextualize it, but going back to the ethics, when you and I prepared it and, and then our conversation, and like I said, like the, the first, one of the first defenders of the Amerindians was um, a priest because he obviously he saw that they were humans just like him, and you talked a lot about dehumanization, which is a very, very practical tool for, <laughs> for you taking rights away. Um, on the ethics part, for you and for Jide, maybe Jide, you can um, tell us a little bit more concretely as well how you try to, and to all the work that you do on the ground, how you try to divert that dehumanization or those campaigns that you mentioned? Um, can you hear me? I, th I think, well, dehumanizing is actually getting people to understand the reality for sexual minorities. First, we are people, we're human beings. And I think that the idea that someone loves someone of the same gender does not erase them from the human race. Mm -hmm. What we've learned over decades and centuries is that you know, people have put laws in place to undermine cultures and, culture and, and traditions that have continued to protect people. And we're now seeing that because even through the uh, British um, colonial laws that many countries still hold on to today, um, it is important that they are decriminalized. Now, of course, many countries don't want to do that because they think that it will impact on the society or the political life, or the society is not ready. But if the society is not ready, then the best advocacy is to ensure that lives are protected. So sexual minorities have the right to life. Mm -hmm. Every country constitution claims that. But then why do we put the lives of sexual minorities at risk? And when it comes to religion itself, um, you know, everybody talks about love your neighbor as yourself, mm -hmm. only if your neighbor is gay. I mean, there was a study in Botswana where they were asking the respondent, um, you know, what will you do if your neighbor is HIV positive, for example? And you can see these two concepts kind of affect me. I mean, about 85% of the respondents said, oh, nothing, you know, it's fine. If they're HIV positive, they're my neighbor, they've got nothing to do with me. And then they actually asked the same respondent the question, if your neighbor was gay, what will you do? Oh, no, we'll kill them, we'll drive them out. That was the yeah. response. Now, the difference between the two is that the Botswana government have put a lot of resources in place to educate the society about people living with HIV, but they've not invested in issues around sexual minorities. So it means that, you know, our communities and government need to invest a lot more to understand marginalized communities. The LGBT people are not the only marginalized people in the world. Left-handed people were marginalized. Uh, people with albinism were marginalized. People with disabilities were marginalized. It's just that LGBT people, you can't tell until we tell you. And that is why the whole thing about marginalization comes in. And unfortunately, I now stand before you dressed in my religious outfit. Religion is just a big, big problem for the LGBT community. Maybe you can share a little bit about the beautiful documentary that you created and invite some of the audience to watch it even. Yeah, I mean, there is actually a video on YouTube. Um, it's called LGBT on God. I mean, if you look for House of Rainbow, you probably will find it. Now, of course, the documentary, it's a short documentary, six minutes long. And it's really just telling the story of how House of Rainbow started. And um, I mean, I, I think I said a little bit in my, in my, uh, in my statement as well. Um, I left England to move to Nigeria, where um, Nigeria is my home country. I was raised in Lagos. so. I knew Nigeria very well. But when, after I found out, after I came out as gay and I studied a little bit more about my own sexuality, I decided to go back to Nigeria. So the documentary was really about me going back to Nigeria, the persecution that I was facing, and then, of course, um, the, the work 
extended from, from Nigeria back to England, and we're still going on strong. And the, the beautiful thing about it is that we continue to impact on communities, we continue to help change lives, we continue to help families as well. Now, some of the things that I found out for myself as well, um, I'm not sure this is in the documentary, was that when I came out as gay, I couldn't communicate with my own siblings and my family about my sexuality. So we left it on, on, on we, left, we didn't talk about it. It was years later that my older brother was telling me that we always love you, but we didn't know how to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. So now we are creating conversations for families and anyone that is coming out because everybody's coming out at the same time. So it's not necessarily that your dad or your mom knows that you're gay or a lesbian, but it's important that we provide that avenue that they can have that conversation Thank together. You. Yeah. Thank you for providing space for people to talk. Thank but you. you and I, Mariana, when we discussed, we also talked a lot about the, the contextualizing of history. And when we discussed the controversy of Valladolid or the debate of Valladolid as we have, it has two different names, depending how you speak about it. Um, but the, it, it's true, it, even in the wording, it's, it's some, for some people it's a debate, for others it's a controversy. For you and I, it's a controversy to think that some people are not human, therefore I can just exploit them. Um, but what was interesting in our conversation is we talked a lot about ethics and how they are very important when we talk about human rights, because it really comes down to this. And that's why we called, we named, every year we give it a different name, but this year was the right to be human. And in a lot of places, um, well, it's very convenient to pretend that people aren't human. Um, but in terms of ethics within your work, is it something that you use to convince corporates to work with you? Because obviously ethics sometimes stays at the door of a lot of companies. Also, they say sometimes, now they don't, but we still know that it's the case. I think that's, that's a hard question. Um, what moves businesses to do things? Um, I'm still trying to figure that out. Sometimes it's evidence and hard numbers coming and telling them, you know, there's 20% of your business that might be in risk of, of being intersecting with a crime. Um, in other occasions, it might be uh, having a certain type of commercial value to it. Um, in other cases, people are generally interested in not having anything to do with anything that might be incorrect. Um, and I believe that most people that have a business actually just want to do things right and maybe don't know the best way how to do things. In any case, that's my experience working, for example, with hotel owners. Um, um, however, I think definitely I, I'd like to, with our discussion, I think something that comes to my spirit is something that uh, Martia Sen said, which was, uh, our ideas of justice in society will define how people live. And I think um, um, we, we're setting the standards of how we're, uh, of what we're willing to accept in terms of other people uh, in, in all the services that we consume, right? So from uh, setting up standards and guidelines and principles of how to spend our money buying fashion, uh, but also like learning, for example, how to travel. Right, like how, what type of tourist we want to be when we go to places, and how much time are we investing in, into doing that. And, and my work, and my dream is to actually set up certain standards. It's to rise the minimum uh, standards because they're very low. Right now they're very, very low. So we need to increase them to a point where at least that minimum is something I am comfortable with when I go someplace to, to do something, to, con to consume something. So we need to s raise those standards. And I think in, in countries, for example, in Latin America, um, uh, and, and I, I, I'd like to say it now because, because I'm in Europe and I feel like I just need to say it. Um, we come to these events and we talk about solutions and sometimes we want to adapt like European and American solutions into Latin American context without realizing that it's not the same as all at all. So, um, so for example, to explain uh, in the hotel sector, there are some certifications and guidelines, but they're mostly spillover from like the UK, UK's Modern Slavery Act, which is amazing to imagine that you have hotels in Mexico that have good supply chain practices, and it comes all the way from the UK Modern Slavery Act. And it's cool, but it doesn't, it's not enough. More than 99% of hotels in Mexico are small and medium businesses really, really small and medium businesses that have no access at all to these like international certifications or no money to actually train people, for example. 
So I think um, setting that these standards needs to be something that uh, uh, that needs to be discussed with specific sectors. Each sector needs to set these standards. For example, tourism sector, uh, it's been very exciting working with 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 them because they 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 have a culture of service in the tourism in the hospitality sector, and listening to them actually agree like this is the minimum we're willing to to uh, to, to support. You know, like this is what we want our tourism sector to look like. It's something very very. Very inspiring, I think, and I just like to say, like, I love for Mexico to have a modern slavery legislation, but we have no le legislation so far, and I'm sure we'll get to it some at some point. But right now, the solution that I have at hand is kind of mobilizing the private sector along with other key uh, stakeholders to actually help raise that, those raise those those standards. And if I can confess myself, where I'm here, uh, I think, for example, just recently like in in December. I invited some uh, French people that I care a lot about to my country, and I took them to Cancun. And I had no time to plan my vacation, so I booked in Airbnb something. Um, and when I was there, I was really disappointed with what I saw. Uh, I mean, Cancun, in Cancun, the, the ocean is sick, the, the sea is dirty, uh, we have child sexual exploitation, um, more often than not, and in the place where we were staying, I actually did some research. Um, turns out that all the people that were working there, like we were staying in this very expat bubble where everything was charged in dollars, and like all the people that were working there actually lived in like in the Van Lieu, no, in, in the in the outskirts of the area, and they had no water, no electricity, had to travel crazy hours to get there, had very very hard working conditions and long hours. They chose to get paid less in order to uh, have, if they want to have any type of social security, for example. And so I felt, honestly, I just was very angry uh, with having given my money to that place. And I did my research later on. It turns out the place we were staying used to be public, um, protected, ecological reserves. Um, so I think I never want to spend my money as a tourist like that ever again and ever want to make people travel like that um, ever again. And we need to understand that that's the, that's the vision of sustainability. We forget that when we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about human rights. Environmental rights are human rights, as well as civic, civic and political rights. We have the right to clean air. We have the right to clean water. We have the right to be paid well for our effort. That's a, that's a whole vision of, of human rights. And I think uh, that's where we would like to, to push, keep continue pushing the, the conversation. For sure. On that note, I think we can invite everyone, myself included, to continue to make choices that are not hindering someone else's rights or yours possibly in the future by making those choices. Thank you so much for being part of this panel. Thank you. And now my next co-panelist, I'm very happy to welcome you, Bridge, Bridgel Shadari, please come join me. All right, Bridge, let's have a conversation, you and I. Oh, it's, it's, I think it should be on. Hello? Okay. There you go. Hi, everybody. Namaste to everybody. Namaste to you. Namaste, namaste. Do you want to start by introducing yourself? Tell us who you are, where you come from. So yeah, my name is Brijlal Choudhury. I'm, I'm a Tharu nation from the foothills of the Himalayas, where the rhinos and the elephants used to roam freely. Uh, now it's in Nepal. <coughs> um, and I grew up in a multi-generational Tharu family. Uh, and I carry the teachings of my, oral teachings of my uh, ancestors of respect, uh, reciprocity, uh, res uh, compassion, uh, yeah, indigenous values, you know? Yes, yeah. yes. So you and I talked a lot before we, we came here to speak together, and you had so many interesting references to human rights, but also the effects of your rights have on the ecosystems that you live in. Maybe you can share that with us. Yeah. <clears throat> 
So I'm a Tharu uh, uh, indigenous people's rights activist and I go uh, in spaces like this to talk about uh, indigenous people's rights because um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, all over the world uh, the, the situation of indigenous peoples is very different than what we know. And before I start again, I just want to uh, remember all those indigenous peoples uh, across the world, the new world that you referred earlier, was brought here in Europe in cages and they were toured around. I just want to uh, breathe for them. I just want to think about them. I want to burn a few incense for their spirit because they never returned <laughs> their family. Uh, I'd say, keep waited, waited for a long time. Uh, so <laughs> I just want to burn some incense for them and I want to think about them. I, I don't want to forget them. Uh, and I hope they find some peace uh, uh, in, in their spirit or in the realm they are right now. So, but yeah, with terms of uh, uh, environmental and human rights. So I, Sarah and I talked earlier about um, indigenous peoples and environmental conservation. <laughs> so we talk about like biodiversity, we're ready to accept there are different species around the world that we need to preserve. But indigenous people are guardians of those species, guardians of those ecosystem. We need to respect their rights too, so that the environment that they live in are protected as well. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we're in a rush now, like, you know, where we, have, uh, we talk about climate anxiety. Uh, people wanna change so fast. They want electric cars, <laughs> but do we know uh, what the resources that, uh, uh, that, that is needed to make electric cars? Lithium, you know, the lithium triangle, people know lithium triangle. Um, yesterday, a few days ago, I was in a panel, uh, uh, we're talking about uh, how lithium is extracted in Chile, um, and indigenous peoples there, brothers and sisters, are struggling, uh, and the government tells them, <laughs> you're violating the constitution of Chile. <laughs> but those brothers and sisters are sovereign nations. Uh, and in, we talked about uh, Declaration of Human Rights, International Bill of Human Rights. Uh, we have International uh, UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, ILO Convention 169, that a lot of Latin American countries have signed. We're not following that, you know? So we're very far behind when it comes to indigenous people's rights and uh, protecting nature, it goes hand in hand. And for any climate discussions, you cannot ignore indigenous peoples. They have to be on the table. When we talk about bi biodiversity, you know, uh, we need to bring indigenous peoples on the table. Uh, and we, ha we need to have an honest conversation, you know, uh, with them because uh, they are the guardians and they have been doing this for a while. And we talked about climate change. They have been doing, they have been adapting they have, uh, with the climate for a really long time. It's not a new thing for them. <laughs> they have lived many disasters. They know when the wind is coming, when the rain is uh, coming. So <laughs> I, I welcome all of you to uh, uh, join indigenous people, invite them with respect uh, and develop uh, good relationships uh, so that uh, together we can create something. And I wanted to share you a story, Sarah. You know, please, <laughs> I, please. I like sharing my grandfather's stories. Um, so one day I was a child and every, we're monsoon people. Our life depends on monsoon rain. If it doesn't happen, um, yeah, <laughs> we do different funny things when the rain doesn't come on time. So, <laughs> so when um, one time the rain was delayed and uh, I asked my grandfather that, oh, the rain didn't come, we need to sow the seed, you know? And my grandfather said, I think uh, there is a trouble with the clouds, the mountains, the ocean, uh, the forest, they're not working together. They need to work together so that the monsoon can come uh, in the time that we need and hence, I, I urge all of us to work together uh, with indigenous people like the clouds, like the mountains uh, and the oceans and the wind and the sun as well, so that uh, there's a monsoon on time. Um, so yeah, that's, <laughs> that's something I wanted to say about uh, the uh, environment. And one more thing that I wanna add is that we're talking about climate change, but um, we need to bring indigenous people's knowledge, their wisdom, their worldviews, their perspective into this conversation 
we cannot exclude anymore. I think we have been excluded for a really long time. And uh, uh, we have to bring those uh, conversations uh, 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 back in, in, uh, with indigenous peoples at every single uh, level, including the local to the UN level. Uh, we, cannot <laughs> we cannot deny uh, access to them. And it's a very new thing, Sarah, you know? Like, so I want to share you a story about uh, this chief of six nations in Canada. Um, uh, his name was Chief Des Deskagage. He was a, a Haudenosaunee. Um, now they have their own passport. <laughs> uh, they are sovereign nations, of course. Uh, in 1923, he went to uh, League of Nations, you know? He was, he was denied access. Nobody wanted to listen to him. <laughs> now this year is the 75th year that he approached United Nations for the violations of uh, uh, their, their, their right to life, right to culture, um, and right to uh, gather, uh, to do a ceremony, and uh, live in their territory peacefully. And I just want to say that if we are working with indigenous peoples, when we're bringing them in, in these climate discussions or the solutions that we're creating, we need to understand how I relate to my mountains, you know? We need to understand how I relate to my rivers. We need to understand how I relate to my land. Otherwise, the solutions that we create is not very long. For, for a Tharu, Tharu person, uh, my mother, she thinks about 15 generations when, he, when she plants the seed. Of course. <laughs> and for, 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 for a profit, uh, uh, and um, I would say, the solutions that we're thinking, we should think like that as well, so that it is much more sustainable, and we make, uh, uh, I say, we don't rush. We we look at all those uh, things around us that that might affect the future generations. And uh, uh, another st st story that I want to share is uh, we eat a lot of fish from the rivers in Nepal, and even the paddy field and the rice field. Um, and. Uh, it's usually my mother who goes to the forest and the rivers um, and men too, but we only take what we need for the day, <laughs> you know? We only take the, the meal that we can uh, eat and the, the, she makes beautiful baskets and she takes the grasses that she needs for one year, not more than that, so that other people can take, you know? So yeah, that's... <laughs> that's yeah, that's ab absolutely. All, all of the points you've touched on, but also the discussions that we had mm -hmm previous to the panel, we talked a lot about timing and the essence of time. And, and I think within this summit this year, I think one of the words that I've heard the most is indigenous people or indigenous, indigenous, mm -hmm. indigenous, in different types of panels as I was walking. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting, as you mentioned. Um, even last night, we, we had an opportunity for an open mic and I cited the, the speech of Chief Seattle from 1887 and how progressive it was. But we also talked, you and I, about the right to have, to recognize the language of a lot of indigenous people, which is, we talked about this with me, uh, or at least my ancestry or where I come from, where the language is still not recognized, but that's a big thing. To recognize someone's language is also an opportunity for them to share their wisdom. Absolutely, Sarah. <coughs> I just want to share my experience, you know, I'm a Tharu nation and we speak Tharu languages, but uh, Nepal is a diverse country. Uh, it was unified forcefully, uh, but some people say it was a good thing, uh, but it was already a federal state uh, uh, before. Um, and I speak Tharu, my mom speaks Tharu. Uh, she doesn't speak Nepali, she doesn't, sp my grandfather didn't speak Nepali. He was denied many opportunities because he couldn't speak Nepali. Mm -hmm. They couldn't even hire a translator, you know. <laughs> Come on. Um, so yeah, like my grandfather sent me to school because he felt ashamed that he couldn't speak a language that was legal uh, or yep. the government used. So he sent me to school and look where I am, you know, I've never been to, I, I lived in Nepal, but I keep moving, you know. I, I, there's a good side at the same time. Uh, I, I'm disconnected from my own territory or my own family. But uh, my mother, she cannot access services, government services, because she cannot speak the language uh, uh, she speaks. The, the services are offered in a uh, different language. So there's a huge pressure for, for us to assimilate, you know? Um, and it's, it goes the same thing for all the indigenous brothers and sisters in North America, Turtle Island, where they were sent to, uh, how to say, uh, 
missionary schools, residential schools, and you can look it up, you know, it wasn't a very pleasant time for, for our brothers and sisters over there. So yeah, it, it creates a lot of, uh, how to say... Uh, of issues, yeah. and, and we talked about it with, even in yesterday's panel on Indigenous Voices, mm -hmm. um, we discussed a lot the importance of the, the language, even with one of the speakers, Zaya, who said that she had to learn to speak Portuguese so that she could basically mm -hmm. represent. But there's, a, there's an interesting thing as well, like uh, we discuss it with her as well, that I feel now um, that I have to speak the language myself, otherwise it would be lost, or at least I won't be able to tra transmit it to my daughter, who's in the audience, by the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, you, you, you bring and, a And you lose that. Yeah. But in, in, the, in the same sentence, it's, it's like there has been um, a sense of ambassadorship mm -hmm. or diplomacy where we have to represent the people that have come before us, and we have to do it with their languages. Otherwise, there's something that's lost. But it's such a task when you're still moving in, a, in an arena where there's still no recognition for, for that. And if we have to do it in another language, then I guess you're doing it perfectly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why my grandfather sent me to school, and I was the only one who left of my home. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, uh, I did. I was really assimilated into Nepali uh, uh, Nepali uh, system, and uh, I have a friend here. <laughs> I told her I was Nepali when I was uh, in high school, uh, but when I had my kid, you know, you mentioned the, your child. That's the moment I felt like, you know, oh my God, all this, all this uh, knowledge and all this like uh, blood memory that I have is sitting in my subconscious, and I'm not using it. And if I don't use it, if I don't teach my uh, two, I have two daughters, and I speak to them in my mother tongue. If I don't teach them, then uh, I will never, <laughs> you know, like my grandfathers will never live, you know. I want, I want them to live. I want my grandmother, my ancestor to live. That's through, beautiful. Through our blood, through our memory, through our dreams. And they are not gone anywhere. They are st still with us, you know, through us. And nobody can, nobody can take them away from, from us, you know. So, yeah, so th uh, that's the moment I, I, I started doing my activi activism work in terms of uh, being indigenous and reclaiming my identity and, uh, how to say, sharing the stories uh, that I, my experiences and um, the world that we're trying to create together. Um, and again, I want to share a story about the healthy forest, you know. Uh, uh, so the Tharu land is very close to the tr uh, subtropical rainforest uh, in the southern foothills of Nepal. And it's, it's a, my grandfather and I went, ventured a lot together. <laughs> he was my fa best friend. Uh, and uh, he showed me uh, all the forests and all the plants and all these livings, you know, that was in the forest. And he told me that, uh, look at the forest, you know, it has space for everybody. Uh, everything grows here. And for a healthy forest, we need very diverse, uh, how to say, plants <laughs> uh, and bushes and trees and everybody has a space there. Nobody is being uprooted, and nobody should be uprooted, <laughs> because uh, my brother, Jeddah, <laughs> Mama Jeddah, you know, everybody has a space in this world. Um, and we talked about uh, two-spirited people in Canada, Turtle Island. We, we, we celebrated when somebody uh, declared them as, them as uh, two-spirited. There was a celebration in family, you know? So it's... Uh, yeah, so I, th I think what you what you're telling with all your stories, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something that I've I've assimilated as, you know, the expression being a force of nature, mm -hmm. and the power that comes with that, which feels that, you know, it's it's kind of interesting how the divide of the human power over nature that they feel that they're superior, but really when you look at the force of nature, you talked about earthquake today, and how if an earthquake happened, it's against, the, you know, it's because of the gaze and trying to, to leverage in some way the power of humans and the power of nature. But I feel like indigenous people and anyone, indigenous or not, when we embody the, the power of nature and its rightful position into our universe, we become invincible. And I think that's what you're trying to tell with your stories. And I think it's very interesting because we know now that, we, we all know now, and I think that's what has been discussed a lot during the summit, is that if we want to we take the step forward,
forward, which actually has been documented in a lot of indigenous um, scriptures. If I can, can I use that word? <laughs> A lot of indigenous scriptures, including the Mayans, I know there's a few Mexicans in the room, um, in the Mayan scriptures, we know that we, are, we would come into this time of a crossroad that a lot of indigenous descendants would feel called to express what their ancestors had tried to address, and that we would have to make a choice. And I think this is the right moment to discuss about the rights of humans, but also the rights of nature and how they are intrinsically connected and how you cannot separate them. But true storytelling is the most beautiful way to do it. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, nobody is above nature, you know. Uh, uh, nat the law of nature is indigenous people's nature, uh, law. That's our, that's our law. We follow the law of nature. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, and that's more. Pa that's what I was trying to say. You said it better than me. But the law of nature is much more powerful, powerful than any yes, type yes, of yes. universal declaration yes. of yes. rights. Yes. It just goes beyond, yes. um, beyond anything that we. Yes. And, and uh, what I thought was interesting in the previous panels that we've done is that we wanted to include on the first one. We wanted to include different voices of mm -hmm. different. So we had a, a person living with a disability, and and their stories were incredible and just as heartbreaking as yours today. Um, and we had so many different things, and we were like, but we should also talk about, we, if we could have animals on stage mm. to speak about their rights. And, and, and of course, I mean, we could have trees, and we could have just all the elements are connected to the rights of being human. Mm -hmm. They are intrinsically connected. And the moment you try to separate them by just creating a structured um, definition of what human rights are, which we do need, mm -hmm. um, but I think we need and that actually was the title of the first panel that we did in 2021, and we had Nemonten and Kimo, uh, who spoke then, um, about nine months pregnant, barefoot in the Amazon, <laughs> uh, through video. But it was very interesting to hear her speak about, you know, like, that our connection to human rights are connected to nature at all times, and, and all times in history. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this year, I don't know if you know, United Nations Permanent Forum of, on Indigenous Issues in New York, uh, this May, they talked about planetary health and indigenous people's rights and health. So our health, like when we talk about health, it's just not our physical health. We have our mental health, spiritual health, mm -hmm. our uh, planetary health. That's all connected to, to indigenous people's health. So health is like a very broad thing for us, you know? and. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bigger force uh, that shows that we're just very small part of uh, this ecosystem that we live in, you know, that needs, uh, uh, and we are nothing compared to uh, the system that exists around us. And you talked about uh, rights a little bit. I just want to uh, take uh, uh, this discussion about uh, the human rights. So the idea of human rights is very individual. That's when the two world clashes. Indigenous people's rights are, uh, how to say, uh, customary, uh, 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 collective rights. So there is a land, uh, and people have been using it for a really long time. Indigenous people, and uh, nobody has legal legal title in it. Uh, that means the government can take, the miners can take as well. So that's where uh, the the member states, the governments, uh, the businesses, how to say, have difficulty understanding when it comes to. Uh, our collective rights, which is uh, very difficult for a lot of organiza organizations to understand. And uh, because of that, uh, 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 we face a lot of problems, uh, especially like when uh, the government takes the land, gives it to the tourism sector, <laughs> gives, it, gives it to mining uh, industries. So this is, these are the things that uh, the businesses, <laughs> governments, uh, the whole world should understand. And indigenous peoples would like to work with uh, people all over the world to, to talk on these issues. And uh, in Geneva, they talk about, uh, there is a lot of guiding principles that have been uh, there, you know, and people like us, they are way forward than our member states or the leadership. Um, there's a lot of kindness uh, that have uh, felt uh, to the places that I've been, uh, uh, and claiming my indigeneity, and I've, I've have have had very kind responses, you know, but it's just leadership uh, in 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 our countries that uh, is a big challenge. They 
they have hard time understanding um, the systems that we lived, uh, the governance system that we have had before the states were created. So all the structures that we have uh, developed is without indigenous peoples. And we need to redesign UN uh, member states, France or Nepal or Brazil, you know, uh, with, indigenous uh, uh, with indigenous people, because those structures are not for indigenous peoples. It, it ignores the worldviews of indigenous people. Um, and it ignores uh, indigenous children to create that world and live in that world that their ancestors have lived. So it's very n the spaces are becoming very narrow, um, and that yeah, it has many consequences, you know. Uh, that crossroad we spoke about. Yeah, yeah. In closing, I really would like, if you can, mm -hmm. to share a few words in your mm -hmm. indigenous language and tell us what they mean. <laughs> you have the floor. Mm -hmm. So I, I just said my name is Brijlal Saudari. I'm from a very small village called uh, Nichuta. And uh, I'm, I, I really uh, am very grateful to my mother. And her name is Janki. Uh, she's a single mother and raised four kids, you know. And she's happy that I'm not with her. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, she's, she's, she's proud that I go and talk about uh, her stories, our ancestors' stories. Um, yeah, and I miss her. Oh, I miss her. My, my, I miss mine too. And my mom is Minana. And she's very happy that I'm talking about indigenous voices too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, namaste. <laughs>